Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Midweek Online. We're here for week six of our study in the book of Mark. I hope that you are ready for another opportunity to dive into God's Word together to see what it says and how it applies to our lives. I'm looking forward to spending the next hour and a half with you. So as we begin, let's pray, and then we'll jump into some worship. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you so much that you have given us the, another, another opportunity to gather together virtually. And as our family uh, begins to gather in and tune in, I pray that you would help us all, regardless of the challenges and struggles that we're facing maybe at the moment, to set those aside and focus on you. Focus on what you have for us. Focus on uh, the ways in which we can come to know Jesus better today because we're here gathered around looking at the word together. I'm thankful for the chance that we have to do this. I'm thankful for the technology that makes it possible. And I'm thankful that we've, we can stay connected even despite our separation physically. Um, may we all grow spiritually tonight because we've decided to give this time to this study. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are uh, struggling with your sound levels or if there's any problems going on that you'd like to report to us, we always want to try to make this better. Uh, you can sign in and uh, comment uh, through the live stream app or you can just text me uh, or James uh, or Milton or, you know, well, that's pretty much who's here actually right now. So um, let us know somehow. You can send us an email. I'll check my email here in a minute. If there's any issues that you have, we want to try to fix them. Uh, but in the meantime, for those of you that are ready, let's gather together for worship. Guys, take it away.
guys. It's really quite something to worship with these guys in an empty room, um, but it's amazing and God uses it. Thank you very much. So tonight, um, once again, I want to remind you to uh, head on over to our website and click on the banner to uh, get the download of our handout for this evening, week six. 
is the one that should be there. I just tested it myself, and I think all the bugs are worked out. For those of you that may have had struggles with it last week, um, give it a try again. Definitely give us a comment if there's uh, any problems that you're having with that still. I want to make sure that everybody gets it. Um, it just helps to have a piece of paper to give us a roadmap of where we're going. So uh, go ahead and grab that if you haven't done so. Mm. All right, so tonight, back we go into the book of Mark. Excited again to jump into this. This has been a fruitful study for me, as I said. Um, last week, we were considering some of the things that we've uh, been surprised by or learned as we've gone through this series so far. And um, we continue to have opportunity to uh, be made aware of some things that maybe we had forgotten about Jesus, about how he responded to circumstances, about the decisions that he made. All these things are live options, and I want to encourage you to continue the process of finding your own observations, uh, taking the time to struggle through the passages yourself. Um, I don't know how much time you have in your day. Uh, I've been struggling with the new reality of having children who are at home going to school uh, without the benefit of their teachers and trying to take that role on. I know that's time-consuming for some. I know some are still working. Um, trying to find time to make this uh, kind of... Um, uh, the, the time that you need to go into a deep study or a deep understanding of observations of a, a book like this can be tough to find, but I encourage you to still do it. Um, but we're going to continue with the same model that we've been using, and I'll be giving you my observations and talking them through. If you are logged in, definitely give us comments, questions. I will try my best to answer them as soon as I see them. Normally, I look down and I see them at a reasonable amount of time, but I, I will do my best to get answers for you uh, to questions or respond to comments as you give them. All right, let's jump in with our normal discussion time, a discussion without a discussion. I don't know uh, who you're watching with tonight. I don't know um, if maybe you're watching this by yourself, if maybe uh, this is later on and you're, you're just kind of taking it all in um, separate from everybody else. I don't know, but these are questions that I hope that you'll wrestle with and I'm going to wrestle with them for you myself as I ask them here, how would you describe the quality of your faith today? Um, I don't mean quantity, I mean quality, the substance of it, and I'll explain in a minute. And then how have you experienced repentance recently? These are two uh, main themes in the text that we're going to find ourselves walking through tonight, and so I thought I'd start by orienting our mind around the realities of these two concepts, faith and repentance. I was made aware this week of an article in a national publication by a very famous theologian that um, talks about the reality of God in the presence of circumstances and situations like the one we're living through now. How should we as Christians respond to the coronavirus? How should we respond biblically? And uh, this particular author uh, stated in a couple of different ways that Christianity doesn't have the answer for the question of why. And he was making a case that sometimes what all we need to do in response to circumstances like this is simply lament, to be sad, to live with our grief. And certainly there's ample room in Scripture to make a case that that's a, a, a valid response to some of the Psalms that give us such a depth of lament and such depth of pain and sorrow don't end with happy endings. Uh, some of the experiences of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament didn't end with happy endings, and if they did, they didn't end with those happy endings for quite some time. We don't have a responsibility to make a happy ending out of this, and I think his re article was in response to uh, some of the ways that Christians can sort of in a knee-jerk reaction kind of say to ourselves, well, there must be a reason for this, or this is all going to turn out for the good. And certainly we have biblical precedent to make that claim. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, all things work together for the good of those who love him and were called according to his purpose. All things meaning all things. And that includes a virus that's difficult for us to understand. And so I left with attention. I don't feel like he was uh, expressing a completely accurate argument regarding the Christian response to this circumstance, but I also find the tension 
of just simply waiting for the good to come out of all of this. And we can certainly find things that we could categorize as good, as beneficial to our lives. We can categorize the way that the church has responded to the circumstances that we're living through as a good. Uh, It's difficult to categorize death as a good, although there is a case to be made for that as well. This is the line, this is the tension that I feel myself as a pastor leading a church through this time there have been moments where i have felt very optimistic and and really felt the presence of the holy spirit strongly and there have been times probably after i've read too much to be honest when i've just not really felt that way maybe that's you too and i say all that in answer to my first question here how would you describe the quality of your faith today. Faith is uh, the evidence of things hoped for and the belief in things not seen and our understanding of how God works in the context of our lives is based on faith. It's based on this notion of trusting that which remains while sort of in our grasp, still not completely within it. Faith is like that. And sometimes we feel stronger in our faith and sometimes we feel like we have more um, of, the, of the ability to uh, hold on to the good even in the midst of the bad. But then there's always that question of what qualifies as good and bad as well. We talk about uh, what Romans 8 says later. I wonder, as you sit down tonight to enter into this study about your faith, I wonder if you, like me, have experienced a decent-sized roller coaster of emotion ranging from fear to optimism to uh, dependence and prayer and despair to hope, back and forth, up and down, depending on the day and the last thing you read. I hope, though, that you can say with me that at the end of all of it, our faith is intact. It may be shaken. It may be uh, tested. We may wonder where God has gone in the midst of all of this. And believe me when I tell you, if that's you, you are just not alone. It's just not the case. Um, so I do hope uh, that you will uh, come along uh, with us on this journey through Mark chapter 6 as we deal with these ideas of faith and how Jesus responds to the faith around him. And then in the context of repentance, the question of how we interact with each other, how we've sinned against each other, how we've sinned against God, because all sin is sin against God. And we think about the concept of repentance, which we've spoken of repeatedly, which is based in two different ideas. One is physically turning the other way from a direction that you're walking towards or a behavioral pattern that you're adopting, and the other is changing your mind about that behavior so that you don't get as tempted as you were to walk down the same path Again, repentance in the context of quarantine might feel odd, and maybe you're being forced to deal with family relationships where there's repentance that's required at this moment. Maybe you have a sense in which God is asking you, calling you to come to grips with sin that you haven't had a chance to come to grips with or haven't really taken the time to because you've been too busy, and now you're not. I don't know. But as we walk through this passage in Mark 6, I want to encourage you to leave these two notions in your mind, faith and repentance. And my hope is that we'll get some understanding of how Jesus responds to these ideas and teaches about these ideas uh, in our text for today. Now in the context, um, we've covered a lot of ground last week the end of chapter 4 and all the way through chapter 5, Jesus is pursuing his mission of proclaiming the kingdom of God in his own way, at his own pace. We talked about Jesus' timing last week and the sense in which he is uh, choosing some things that maybe don't feel obvious to us. Why would he do this? Why would he do that? The deliberate choices he's making to bring healing only to them, to those who he chooses, the demoniac and the garrisons. Uh, Jairus' daughter, the bleeding woman, there are others to be sure, but there are also others that don't. These are examples that are visible to many in order for people to begin to continue to understand Jesus' identity and authority. The, The notion is, what business do we have in listening to Jesus at all? 
we've, uh, if you're putting yourself in the shoes of people who lived in the area at the time, you're living your life, you're practicing uh, Jewish law, Jewish customs, or maybe you're a Gentile and practicing other kinds of worship or other kinds of life, and all of a sudden, here comes this man who has this authority to do things that you've never seen before, and you don't understand why is he doing these things? How is he doing these things? What's the purpose behind the choices that he's making to bring healing, to bring, to bring forgiveness in the case of the paralytic even? In, in these contexts, these are choices that Jesus is making for a purpose. He's declaring the presence of the kingdom of God, and in order to do that, his display of power, his foundational authority, that he has to be listened to. You can't ignore him. You might reject him, but you can't ignore him. These are the things that he continues to practice, and this is what we struggled with uh, last week as we walked through the end of chapter 4 and all the way through chapter 5. So my hope is that we'll continue to see Jesus doing the same thing. He's still on this path of proclaiming the kingdom of God, proclaiming his identity and authority, using healing and supernatural power to make it clear that he is who he says he is. And that we should respond with faith and repentance. All right. So, let's read this passage together. Uh, This is going to be Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 29. Let's walk through this together. Here we go. He went away from there, where he was at the end of chapter 5, and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. And he called to the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house... Stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod was on his his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry because of his oaths and his guests. He did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And here we are. 
the word of the Lord for us tonight. Mark 6, 1 through 29. Um, once again, if you have observations or questions as we go along, go ahead and fire them off. Um, uh, I uh, was noticing one, actually, that did come in already, referring to the earlier section. Uh, Randy asked, how does one get the opportunity to teach in the synagogue during Jesus' time? At this point, when Jesus comes back to Nazareth, uh, he's got a lot of clout because his name is known, as, as we find out later in this chapter. And so they would have been eager to hear him. They would have been a little surprised to hear him, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it would not have been uh, difficult for them to realize that this was a rabbi who would have justified in saying, hey, I can preach here, um, and they can uh, let him do that and would, be, would have been willing to let him do that for sure. All right. Observations. Here are mine, and we'll walk through this together. Back up to the first verse of chapter 6. Jesus returns to Nazareth with his disciples. It says his hometown. It's not identified clearly as Nazareth, but from what else we read here in the passage, and the people that know him and his family, it's very obvious to assume that he's returning to the place where he spent his childhood, where he actually grew up. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach, again, probably being welcomed in for such a time as that. People who knew him as a child and knew his family could not understand how Jesus could do what he was doing. And here we have to put ourselves in their shoes for a minute. Let's imagine that you knew Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus, and however many other kids would be coming along afterwards, uh, and, and you're watching this family grow up, and you've seen him grow up from the time, you know, he's basically a toddler, um, to the time now that you're seeing him as an adult, probably about 30 years of time. And you know that this is the man who was a carpenter, and this is Joseph's son, and he's got all these brothers and sisters here, and we saw this all take place. We saw him grow up. Why and how could he possibly be doing and saying the things that he's doing? We know this guy. This guy basically was normal. He was average in their sight. People who knew him and understood that they had watched him grow actually did not understand how he could have the authority and the wisdom that he is having. It's not a surprise, really. I don't know if that's ever been something that you've experienced um, being at home again with people who have known you since the beginning. Maybe you've gone through a lot of changes as you've grown up. Hopefully you have. Hopefully you're not the same person as you were when you were a toddler or an elementary schooler or even a high schooler. And you come back and you are, have the opportunity to meet people and connect with them again. Maybe they are always seeing what they used to see. It's not out of the question for that to be a real response of the people that Jesus is running into. And it's fascinating to me, actually, that they say some of the things that they say. And I want to show you what I mean. What do they say? What are their, what is their, their, their troubles with him? <clears throat> Where did this man get these things, these things, these ideas that he's preaching? What is the wisdom given to him? They're wondering how he could have actually gotten all of this, these ideas how are such mighty works done by his hands? The same guy that maybe built my coffee table for me is now using the same hands to heal people. How is this even possible? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother James, Ju Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters? Obviously, there's a family going on here. This is just a guy. Why and how is this possible for him to have this authority and this wisdom? And it says that they, the people took offense at him. Now, this is fascinating. It's not just, hey, welcome back. Glad to see you. It's been a while, but I'm glad you're here. And obviously, you're doing some things, so I'm curious. It's, no, I don't like you. You are doing something that's making me mad at you. You are teaching something that's making me frustrated. And so, Mark needs to tell us that people who have, again, this long-term relationship, are actually offended by his teaching. Uh, I, I made a joke several weeks back, actually, in a different context about how important it is to realize that we're never going to stop offending people if we actually preach the gospel. It is never going to be something that people are going to be like, oh, well, that's just wonderful. 
there's always going to be something that someone struggles with, even if initially they understand the truth of what Jesus has accomplished for them on the cross and the forgiveness of sin that's available. They have to recognize that they're sinners for the gospel to make sense, and that's where we run into problems. And it's true here that Jesus is talking to them about this concept of repentance that was part of his teaching from the beginning. All the way back in chapter 1, from the moment he arrives on the scene, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn. Stop what you're doing and change. And that always makes people so happy, doesn't it? What that's telling them is that there's something that needs to change. There's something wrong. And none of us want to hear that. So this offense that they're taking has to do with their skepticism of his roots, having seen him grow up, but it also has more to do with the content of what he's saying. And then there's this thing where he's healing people too. So he's telling me something that I'm offended by, but he's also doing something that I'm really a big fan of, especially if I'm connected with anybody that's gotten healed or I've been healed myself. What do I do with that tension? These guys are saying they are offended. They don't want to hear it. Uh, observation here from Terence, the Jews saw his miracles and still don't believe like their forefathers. So this display of power does not necessarily lead right to belief. And again, I think my hunch is that part of the reason is of the content of what Jesus is teaching. They don't want to hear it. So the people took offense at him. Jesus responds with this truism, this old proverb type idea that a prophet will not be accepted in his hometown. He understood that this was going to be difficult for people that knew him as a child, they're they're not going to be accepted. It's okay. That's just the way that it is. I mean, it's not okay, but he's not surprised by it. Their offense does not keep him from teaching. He is expecting this kind of pushback from people. And he's already gotten it, actually, uh, even in the book of Mark. So this is the interesting part about this first event here. He could do no mighty work there, Not because he was powerless, but because of unbelief. Make sure you catch that in verse 5. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Okay. He couldn't do anything, or uh, uh, he couldn't do uh, specifically a mighty work, but he still healed people. So it's not like all of a sudden Jesus forgot how to heal people or lost the power to heal people. Somehow, some way, their unbelief, he marveled at them because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their consistent rejection of him, their offense at him. And so his work was impacted by their unbelief. His Uh, the ability, I mean, we've already seen him heal people. We've already seen the power that he has. It's not a question of, oh, I I guess I just, I don't know how to heal people anymore. It was connected with their response to him that there was no quote-unquote mighty work, a larger work of healing, as we've seen him do other places where he heals many. That's not what happens here. A couple of people still get healed, so we know that Jesus hasn't stopped displaying supernatural power but he could do no mighty work there. And he marveled because of their unbelief. There is a connection between their unbelief and his response to them. So hold on to that. Now, uh, he went about among the villages teaching, and then he decides to call the 12 together and he begins to send them out two by two. So they're going to actually have a job to do. He gives the disciples... Authority over unclean spirits. So now we have regular old run-of-the-mill human beings that have been given supernatural power and authority to cast out unclean spirits. And that should just sort of kind of blow our minds a little bit, right? I mean, again, what, who did he pick? Who were the guys that were with him? Who were the ones that he specifically sought out. They're fishermen. There's a tax collector over there. There's some other guys with no real longevity or or renown or reputation as the cream of the crop. These were not the guys that you would expect to be given this power, and then all of a sudden, bam, now they have it. So when run-of-the-mill Peter, run-of-the-mill Matthew walks into your city and starts healing people of unclean spirits, 
I'm guessing you're going to take notice. And they did. But what else does it say about this trip? Well, Jesus says to take nothing with them, to sustain themselves. Don't, don't pack a big bag. Don't make sure your bank account's full. Just go. Jesus told them to find people who they would accept them and care for them while they're preaching. So you find somebody in a village, you stay there as long as you're in that village. These guys are affecting, uh, are listening to you, they're affected by you, they're welcoming you and stay there. And then he says to shake off the dust that is on your feet against those who won't listen. So these guys don't want to hear from you, shake, uh, theoretically, just wave goodbye. Okay, guys, you don't want this, I'm out. See you later. Um, observation here. From Jack, it is interesting to note that Jesus' father not mentioned along with his mother and the rest of the family. That's true. There's some speculation, a lot of speculation actually, about what happened to Joseph. Could he have died earlier on in Jesus' childhood? Not a lot of people were sure about that, uh, to my knowledge. There, I know there's others that have studied that more than I have, um, but he's not there at this point, and, and there's not a clear explanation as to why that is. But it's true, he's not there. So, Jesus told them to shake off the dust on your feet against those who would not listen, and so they go. These normal, run-of-the-mill guys who have spent this time with Jesus and have been given the supernatural power go out throughout these villages, their surrounding areas, and proclaim what? Repentance. Verse 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. There's that word again, the one that everybody loves, because something's wrong with you. Something has happened in you. You are a sinner, and sin needs to be repented of. And when I walk in to your town and walk up to you and tell you that, you've got two choices. You either say, yup, I agree with you, and I repent, or get away from me because you don't know me, and I'm not listening to you. Do you see how awkward that would have been. It still happens today. Although uh, under our shelter-in-place order, it's difficult to find it as much as before. Near my house, there's uh, folks who gather on the corner with bullhorns and signs uh, calling people to repentance. And I don't know how effective it is. I'm imagining that it is. And I'm imagining that those folks that are doing that are, are obeying the call of God to, to proclaim that. And there's nothing wrong with what they're saying as far as all that I've heard as I've stopped at that stoplight and listened to them speak. But I can imagine that for a lot of people, they're not going to walk up there and say, yeah, you're right. I'm a sinner. That takes humility. That takes the Holy Spirit to work in someone's life to bring them to the place where you have the ability to humble yourself and really be clear on that. And that's what these guys were doing. The disciples proclaimed repentance and they displayed the supernatural power. They cast out demons and they healed people. Another comment here. One interpreter suggested, uh, Mark and Mary Lynn say, one interpreter suggested that shaking the dust off means to consider this town as if you've never entered it all at all or to come back at another time. That may be true. There's um, various ways of interpreting that concept. Uh, generally speaking, though, it's a rejection, or it's a response to a rejection. You don't want me here, you can keep your dust. I'll, I'll leave it with you, and I'll go to the next place. But in general, that's kind of the idea. And then Terrence, take nothing with you seems a lot like the correlation to the rich man to leave all behind and take up his cross. There, there could be, uh, there's certainly a connection in the messages that are being spoken about at that point. Um, But in this context with the disciples, I think he's after something a little bit different. Um, The disciples have already demonstrated an ability to follow, and the rich man had not. Um, But I think Jesus is telling them, hey, who are you going to rely on in this? What are you going to count on? Are you going to count on your stuff, or are you going to count on me? Are you going to count on the Holy Spirit? Are you going to count on God's movement in your life to, to sustain you in this moment? I think that's kind of the idea, but similar in what the content of the message is, to be sure. So, this is the second event in this text talking about the sending out of the disciples and their ministry in the area. <clears throat> King Herod then hears of the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. Verse 14, Jesus' name had become known and King Herod 
heard of it. King Herod, um, we're going to talk about him in just a second to make sure that you're clear on which Herod we're talking about. But it's clear that if, it, if the word of Jesus' ministry is getting up to basically the king, the whole, the tetrarch of the area, the one who was responsible for all of it, that Jesus' name was becoming famous. And interesting kind of commentary here from Mark He tells us that there's some discussion amongst King Herod and his inner circle, apparently, uh, of who Jesus really is. There were some who believed that Jesus was the resurrected John the Baptist. Others believed that Jesus was Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, or simply a prophet of old. Herod himself believed that Jesus was the resurrected John the Baptist, and Mark uses this opportunity to present the account of how John the Baptist died, because we didn't know that until Herod uh, says that, and now Mark's going to tell us the details of John the Baptist's death. But let's talk about King Herod for just a moment so that we're clear on who we're talking about. Uh, Herod Antiochus, son of Herod the Great, ruled Galilee and the surrounding area from 4 BC to 39 AD. Um, A couple of interesting notes about him. He alienated Jewish people in a couple of ways. Uh, He married his brother's wife, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and he made his capital on the site of an ancient cemetery, making it impossible for Jewish settlers to live there. One commentator uh, calls that a specific decision that no Jewish settler would want to live in that area and then be so associated with dead uh, or death and be unclean ceremonially, and so they wouldn't go there. Um, Herod doesn't care about these things, and this is Herod Antiochus. His decision-making is interesting. Uh, and it's certainly uh, something that comes back uh, here as we talk about how we respond to John the Baptist. Let's see. I like, uh, James says, I like to consider that you have never entered and come back and preach the gospel again uh, to them carrying no resentment from the last time you did. So interesting, talking about that potential uh, interpretation of shaking the dust off your feet, maybe not coming back or, or wanting to come back, but Um, maybe you will, maybe you won't. It's not clear whether or not they would. Jesus doesn't give them specific instructions there. Um, There's some ideas that are definitely hard for us to actually come to specific uh, firm conclusions on as far as that's concerned. But it's definitely an understanding of acceptance of rejection. You don't want it, I'm good, I'm out, and I'm going to the next place. Okay, so let's take a look at what Herod does Uh, and talking about uh, his dealings with John the Baptist. Herod had John the Baptist arrested after John told Herod that that he was wrong to take his brother's wife Herodias as his own. So this is Mark here giving us this uh, response. Um, Verse 16, uh, he starts by making it clear that Herod believed that this was, in fact, Jesus was, in fact, John the Baptist, and John was beheaded. And then right in verse 17, Mark jumps into the story. Uh, Herod had sent and seized John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, because he had married her. Uh, John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Hey, king, you're wrong. And I'm going to stand in front of you and tell you that you're wrong, and I'm going to show you that you're wrong, and I'm not going to stop telling you that you're wrong. Hmm. But Herod wanted to do things his way. And he was very used to being able to do things his own way. <clears throat> but John still steps up and continues to tell him. And now this is interesting. Herod feared and protected John. <clears throat> Verse 19, Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to put him to death. You can't tell the king who to marry. I'm I'm married to king. You're not messing with that. No, no, no. But she could not put him to death because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. Fascinating response. Herod is listening to the guy who's telling him he's wrong, who's telling him he shouldn't do this, who's telling him he should change, and yet he still wants to hear him. He still wants to keep him safe. He still wants to protect. He could have just lopped off his head whenever he wanted, but he didn't. And this is interesting too, verse 20. When he heard him, when Herod heard John teaching, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. I wish this was true today. I wish 
that whenever anyone on either side of the political divide, the religious divide, pick a side, I wish that somehow, some way, we would be able to be perplexed by what somebody might be telling us. Perplexed meaning uh, confused or at some level, I'm not quite sure if I agree with that, but still listening. That's one of the worst problems that we're facing as a country right now. Other than the health and the obviously the, the real physical responses and the, the consequences of this disease, I'm not undermining that at all. That is horrible. And yet, somehow, some way, uh, it seems like our rhetoric has gotten worse instead of better. And that's what I had to decide recently and have to decide daily to stop reading. Man, wouldn't that be nice? So what does Herod get wrong? What does Herod get right? It's interesting. It's interesting that Mark here does not paint Herod as this evil guy. He gives us these details that hold us, uh, that give us a bigger picture of who he is. <clears throat> it's definitely not shaking off the dust off your feet if John keeps telling Herod that he's wrong. That's absolutely right. There was no shaking off of dust in that point. Of course, John wasn't told to do that, was he? And John wasn't that kind of guy, to be honest. Uh, nothing really stopped him from his mission, to be sure. Uh, ha- had he been told to, I'm sure he would have obeyed, but I'm pretty sure in that case he just kept on going. And Herod did not kill him. Herod listened to him. But Herodias still held this grudge against John and wanted him to be killed, so the opportunity came at Herod's birthday banquet. Herodias' daughter impressed Herod, and she was told by her mother for the head of John the Baptist. So you see how that all plays out? So the, the, the girl impresses everyone. The girl impresses Herod. Herod says, I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. He vowed it. And Mark, Mark has him speaking twice Basically the same idea to make sure that we're clear that this is a promise. Herod's making a promise to this girl in front of everybody and he is not going to back off from that promise. He is going to be held to that promise. And so what did she do? She runs out and talks to mom. Hey mom, what do you want? What should I do here? And Herodias, seeing the opportunity, I know just the thing. Go ask for John the Baptist's head. And not sure what Herodias thought about that, but she does it, and she's obeying. She comes back, she asks for John the Baptist's head, and Herod, actually, it says what Herod's response to that was. Um, When she came in with haste, saying, this is verse 25, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's a quite vivid way of asking for someone to die, but okay. And the king, verse 26, was exceedingly sorry But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. Why is Mark painting Herod with this sort of gracious paintbrush? He's giving him humanity here, which is odd. Herod's, the Romans in general, these guys, these are the the guys that you're supposed to fear. These are the enemy, and why would you want to make them look better? But there's something genuinely going on, I think, And again, I don't know. I'm speculating. There's something genuinely going on in Herod's heart here. He doesn't want to kill John the Baptist. He's fascinated by him. If John still continued to have the opportunity to talk to him, uh, at least on some regular basis, could it have been that Herod would have become a follower of Jesus? I have no idea. But at least there was enough for Herod to say, I don't want to kill him. That makes me sad. I I don't want it. But he made the promise in front of everybody, and so that's, in fact, what he is uh, commanded to do. <clears throat> Let's see. Terrence, Nathan and John have similar hearts, both standing before kings, but one king listens and obeys. Yeah? Uh, Mark, uh, or, or uh, certainly Mark tells us that Herod maybe wanted to make a different choice, but couldn't because of the public nature of his promise. And so he immediately sends the executioner with orders to bring John's head, and that's what happens. He didn't want to kill him, but made an oath, so she gave, uh, he gave Herodias what she asked for. He had John beheaded, and John's disciples buried John, verse 29. And that's the end of our text. Three events, and generally speaking, in a little more detail than we're used to from Mark. As he's gone along here, he's added on a lot more commentary, a lot more perspective, on events than what we originally started with in the first couple of chapters. I hope you've seen that as a pattern. 
So now let's think about this. What is Mark trying to do in this passage? Well, um, let's talk about the role of faith. Where does faith show up in these events? How does this look? Well, the lack of faith in Nazareth impacted Jesus' work among them. And I cannot, I cannot make this clear. You cannot believe or assume that somehow Jesus was powerless in Nazareth to do a mighty work. That's not what Mark is saying. What Mark is saying is the lack of faith around him, the way that Nazareth received him, impacted his choice to do a mighty work in Nazareth. There is a connection between faith and the work of God. What does that look like? Is it always the same? There's a lot of other places, and we've already seen some, where Jesus says that your faith has made you well. It was Jesus' power that actually does the healing, but it's your faith has made you well. There's a connection, and Mark makes it pretty clear. But it's not that Jesus was powerless by no means. It's the lack of faith that impacted that work. Now, on the flip side, the presence of faith among the 12 impacted their work among the villages where they preached and healed. Okay, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Guys, gather around. I'm going to pair you off. You two, you two, you two, you two, you two. You're going, and guess what? Right now, I'm giving you power to cast out unclean spirits, and you're going to go, and you're going to proclaim the kingdom of God. You're going to do what I've been doing. Guess what? First mission trip right here. Ready? Go. Do you say yes? If that's you. Seeing what you've already seen? Is that something that's like, yep, I'm in, let's go. Does it take faith for them to go ahead and step foot into those villages and call out people on their sin and proclaim repentance? Would it take faith for you? Would it take faith to believe that you actually had the power to do that, to to cast out the unclean spirits like they did? And, And they did, they cast out unclean spirits. Would it be possible for you to just take Jesus' word for it, that, yep, you've got that power now, go. Faith had to play a role in their decision to obey. And what you choose to do with the challenge uh, of that kind of challenge is really going to tell a lot about who you are. I mean, what would they have done had they not seen everything that they had seen, and yet Jesus still tells them to go? Uh, does the fact that they have these responses because they've seen what Jesus can do is part of the discussion. Um, is there a connection, and Terrence asking, uh, faith and free will? Yeah, I mean, there's a decision made. Uh, there's no robots here. These aren't pre-programmed guys. Jesus is telling them something, and they got to put one foot in front of the other. No doubt about that. But if I don't have faith, I'm much, much less likely to walk into anybody else's village and start doing that. I'm much, much less likely to walk into a mission trip experience and to go to another country or to go to my own neighborhood, to walk down my own street and let people know that what they really need to do right now is repent. Faith. When I have a relationship with somebody, when I'm maybe quarantined with somebody who struggles in the faith, Do I have faith enough to start conversations, to believe that God can use this crazy, ridiculous time that we're living through to strengthen someone's faith? Is that possible? Could he use me for something like that? You see what I'm saying? Faith is a part of all of this, and they responded in faith. John the Baptist responds in faith. John the Baptist responds in faith from the very beginning. He's, he knows what his mission is. I still uh, live by the best that I can, and I don't do it perfectly. John's statement in John 3.30 when he says, he must increase and I must decrease. He must become greater, I must become less. John dedicated his life to that, and that takes faith. That is not something that is just generated by our own free will. There's no reason for him to have done that. And certainly when that axe is about to fall on his neck, he had to wonder. Or did he wonder? Would you wonder? Was it worth it? Should I? Could I have done anything different? Fascinating to put yourself in his shoes. He also had the faith enough to tell truth to power. 
hey, Herod, you're wrong. The guy that had the executioners working for him, you're wrong. Okay, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to call it out. And faith, I think, to accept his fate, that this is what was going to happen to him. He was going to give his life, telling the truth, calling out what he needed to call out. The role of faith and repentance all the way through this. Do you see how these two concepts carry throughout this entire passage? Man. <clears throat> Jack says, even so, it appears that John the Baptist even dealt with his own faith and doubts about Jesus being the Messiah. Matthew 11, you're absolutely right. That's a good cross-reference. Matthew 11, verses 2 and 3. J- J- John's in prison, sends Jesus. Hey, are you the one that we're waiting for, or should we be expecting someone else? So there's at least a moment there where John's even like, okay, was this really the right thing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, does that mean that even a guy like that could struggle? Yeah. But did he get over it enough to tell the truth? Yeah. Man, doesn't that tension, does that feel, really, that, 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 the, the line there? Mark and Mary Lynn says, it gets me how John spent about one year in Herod's prison Long enough for him to have some doubts, but he never got out, and it ended with this. Yes, it ends with this. It ends with the executioner's axe falling. Was it worth it? There are missionaries, there are believers today giving their life for their faith because of their faith. Not pre programmed robots, a decision to dedicate themselves to proclaiming the kingdom of God in a place where it's dangerous and life-threatening to do so. Man, and what do we do? How do we respond to this? Well, let me give you a couple of ideas and then we'll hear from Francis about this. Repentance and faith. Jesus preached repentance and people took offense. Jesus looked for faith and found none in Nazareth. The disciples preached repentance and looked for faith and they found some. John the Baptist preached repentance to Herod based on faith. So, following Jesus requires repentance, and a life of discipleship is based on faith. Is repentance a fundamental part of your life? And how is your faith affected by your repentance? I've been saying repeatedly since the lockdown order went into effect that we'll have time, I hope, to spend thinking about our own spiritual condition, spiritual condition of the people in our household, trying to figure out ways to grow and to move forward. And boy, is that a challenge when a lot of us are scared and we're unsure and there's so many things that are changed that it's hard to keep up and and we're tired and And we just don't know how this is all going to turn out. I don't know how you're all dealing with it. I don't know where your heart is with all of it. But I do know for certain that these topics of faith and repentance carry the day regardless of a pandemic. And in fact, the presence of a pandemic should call us to bring these two topics much more to light than maybe we had time to before. And I'm hoping that as a church, I'm hoping that as an individual, I can do that. We can do that together. What do you need to repent of? And to whom do you need to repent? John, not John the Baptist, John the writer would later tell us that uh, to confess your sins one to another and so receive the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that comes from Jesus. That strengthens faith. Confession can strengthen faith. And faith can drive us to repentance. I don't have a reason to deal with my sin if Jesus is a fraud. None. I have no business, no desire to say anything's wrong with me that needs fixing if Jesus is a liar. I have no reason to. But if I do believe, if there is faith that what Jesus is talking about is real, It means I need to respond. I need to act. Faith and repentance, interconnected concepts that transform lives and certainly are the hallmarks of discipleship, of being a Christian at all. 
Friends, if this, is, um, this is an opportunity. I, I read today that there are those who believe that every single one of us is going to be affected by someone who's going to die from this disease. I don't know if that's true. I know that there are a lot of people who are struggling right now. I know that there are a lot of people throughout the planet who are struggling right now, who are scared right now. People that aren't even experiencing the physical symptoms are wondering if they're going to and wondering if someone near them that they, are, that they love are going to. This is not a fraud. It's not a hoax. It's actually a real thing. The extent of it is yet to be seen. But here's what I know for sure. This is an opportunity for the church to become more grounded in Jesus, more grounded in our faith. And that means repenting. Repenting of what, you say? Repenting of my attitudes, repenting of uh, the, the ways in which I have idolized other things. So many things are being toppled and structures are coming down around us and the economy and the way that our, our lives are being lived. The patterns of life are all different now than they ever were before and it gives us a chance to say, maybe those were idols. Maybe I don't need them. I don't know. But faith demands response. And that response has to include repentance. And I hope that you'll have the chance and will take this opportunity, whatever your life looks like right now, to at least dwell on this a little bit. I'm going to let Francis give us a little bit more exhortation in that regard, and then we'll close our time. Nazareth right now and this is the spot where the synagogue stood this is where Jesus would have grown up attending the synagogue and this is where he was learning because remember he had a very normal childhood and he had to grow in his knowledge and this is the place where he would have done it but then in Mark chapter 6 he goes back to his hometown and now he comes as a teacher in the synagogue and that's where you have uh, in chapter 6 verse 1 it says, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Okay. Typically, we look at this passage and we go, gosh, he went to his hometown and they reject him. But we have the benefit of hindsight, which is massive. You, you've got to put yourself in their time, in their day. You've got to understand their view of God and understand what a sacred, sacred thought they had. Yeah, I mean, what they knew of God was what they read in the scriptures about Isaiah and his vision and the angel just screaming out his holiness. What they remember is Moses going on this mountaintop and, and, and they understand the, the holy of holies in that sanctuary and, and the thought of man interacting with God was, 
was something so intense. So, so that is all you know is this God who the people used to beg Moses, hey, don't let that God speak. We can't, we can't bear his voice. And now suddenly this man comes into this synagogue and makes these claims and they're going, Wait, a, you're talking about Almighty God, and here's a kid that used to sit here and learn. And I know his sisters, I know his brother. And, and so while they were astonished by his works, astonished by his teaching, they're also going, I, I, I can't believe this. But understand how it must have been so much more difficult for them because they don't have the benefits that we do today. And, and, and yet at the same time, God doesn't excuse their unbelief, but it says very clearly, and when you read the Gospels, you see that faith is a huge, how can you read the New Testament and not understand that faith is massive in the sight of God? And here he says that very interesting thing that he could do no mighty works in this city because of the people's unbelief. In fact, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. Faith is huge, huge, huge to God. And that's why, you know, when people don't believe, it's easy for us to do what we do in this passage in real life, where we go, gosh, how could they not understand? How could they not believe? But at the same time, you've got to realize there are people today and they're stuck in their unbelief and sometimes we can almost have a judgmental attitude like why didn't they believe and why don't these people believe but don't you understand what scripture says that faith is a gift from God and and, and it's and that's why you see the Apostle Paul saying the natural man's not going to understand the things of God there's these spiritual things. That's why Paul would spend time on his knees and God, would you enlighten the eyes of their heart? You have to open up their hearts. You have to, that's why he's on his knees praying. We should, we should never judge someone for their unbelief. If we really believe it was a gift from God, then we shouldn't judge their unbelief. Instead, we should be on our knees saying, God, you gave me this gift. Would you give this same gift to them? You know, the point is, is if you believe in Jesus Christ right now, that was something God just handed to you. That was a gift. It was a free gift of his grace. It's not because you were some super spiritual person. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. And so these people in Nazareth, they don't believe. Meanwhile, you see Jesus in this, in this section is sending out the 12. And these 12 are going to these different villages. And it says that the result of that was that uh, they were preaching repentance and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So as they went out in faith, there must have been faith out there because they were able to cast out these demons, uh, anoint people with oil. And then right after that, you have the story of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist explaining how he got imprisoned. Why? Because he was telling Herod to repent. And it's in that story that John the Baptist is beheaded. So you see, you've got two groups with faith. You've got the apostles and the result of their faith at that point was the healing of the sick, the casting out of demons. You have John the Baptist who had tremendous faith, so much faith that he told Herod to uh, repent of his adultery and it got him uh, beheaded. And so as we live our lives of faith, we need to understand there will be times of celebration, times of repentance, and there's times of persecution. And uh, it's also a good time to just remember John the Baptist. We started this book out talking about John the Baptist, this humble, amazing man who understood who God was and understood just the, 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 the worth of Jesus and saying, I don't want any glory for myself. He is the one who, is, who should be glorified. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And here comes the end of his life where he gets beheaded because of his stance on the truth. What an incredible model for us. A man who spent his life giving all the glory to Jesus and at the end being beheaded for it.
and we celebrate him today. We uh, hopefully now look at his life and say, you know what, that's what I want to be about. Let me spend my life telling people, don't look at me, look at him, and then when it ends, I pray that I give him glory, even by the way I leave this earth. Good stuff, challenging uh, exhortation tonight. Um, I know I feel convicted even teaching it, and I'm thankful that uh, you stayed with us long enough to hear it and think through it for yourself. Um, Please continue to uh, be on the lookout for uh, emails and the upcoming series um, as we go through. Mark, just so you know where we're going again. Um, if you go, if you have Right Now Media, you can find the series with Francis Chan on there, and the way that he's broken down the series is the way that I'm breaking it down, so you can know where we're going next. Um, try to take time to find some observations and to work through the passages for yourselves. Thank you for the comments tonight. Really appreciate all the ways that we are uh, engaging, even though we're not together, um, and uh, just really thankful that you're just invested in this kind of study. I really uh, I'm thankful to be a part of a body of Christ here that's in, invested like that. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to pray, uh, and then we'll be finished for tonight. We will be back uh, right here again on Sunday morning to continue our series on 1 Corinthians. Uh, if there are others, again, who maybe don't have the access that you do, uh, and let them know uh, how to get it, invite them, put it out on social media so that people know uh, how to find it for themselves Uh, And be looking at our website, be looking at our Facebook page to get continual encouragement. Pastor Ben's been doing uh, some online devotionals about our uh, Read Through the Bible project. There's a bunch of other stuff on there. Take a look, and uh, and I I encourage you to use this time to not be afraid, but to ask good questions about your faith and to come to a, a, a continual place of repentance so that you can uh, come out of this time, because it will end, uh, come out of this time uh, understanding your life and understanding your faith just a little differently and maybe a little deeper than you did before. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the examples that we find, uh, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. Thank you for how it's uh, arranged and how we can find uh, these nuggets of truth and these perspectives that we desperately need right now. Uh, Continue to help all of us uh, to walk through these uncertain days dependent on you and you alone. May our idols fall and our repentance rise in response to this time of potentially some introspection. Use uh, this for your good. Even as we lament, even as we struggle, even as we're afraid, we call on you for healing. We call on you for peace. We ask that you would protect all of those healthcare workers who are on the front lines of this. Give them strength and courage as they continue to wake up every day to go into battle with this. And I pray for uh, all of us in our neighborhoods and in our context and the sphere of influence that we have to be a light for you. May we love and serve and proclaim the kingdom of God every day. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night. We'll see you again soon. Take care.